The fall conference season is right around the corner, and we've got two events that you need to put on your calendar. On October 19th, we are back with Transition AI New York. Transition AI is the leading B2B event for energy practitioners and artificial intelligence experts. The New York event will explore current use cases and deployments within electric utilities, the role AI can play in streamlining project development, maximizing revenues, and integrating DERs. Plus, I'm going to do some live interviews and storytelling on stage. We'll present some deep market research, and we'll have a workshop on use cases. Our listeners get 10% off by using the promo code PSPODS10. Come join me, our journalists and researchers, and a bunch of experts in Manhattan for Transition AI. Register at the link in the show notes or go to transition-ai.com. And for you West Coasters, Canary Media is holding another Canary Live. This one is in Berkeley, California. It is on October 3rd. These events are super fun. We've hosted a couple of them with Canary. Uh, Panelists are handpicked by the Canary editorial team, and they'll dive into all things related to the energy transition, the Inflation Reduction Act, technology, and uh, innovation. Drink, eat, socialize with clean energy leaders, investors, inventors, public leaders, and advocates. You can follow the link in the show notes to get your tickets to Canary Live Bay Area today. Transition AI New York, Canary Live Bay Area. Put them on your fall calendar for October. We'll see you there. From the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. In an effort to make the scale of our problem with heat-trapping gases resonate and get beyond scientific terms like parts per million and tons of CO2, there are lots of good analogies out there for emissions. Some involve slices of cake, weight loss, turning ships around. But if you talk to anyone in the carbon removal space, they'll almost certainly point you to this one. So I like to think of it as sort of a bathtub. Savvy Bowman is an expert on carbon management at ClearPath, a nonprofit focused on how to support tech innovations to reduce emissions. I cover point source capture. I also work a little bit on steel and concrete manufacturing decarbonization and natural and agriculture solutions. But I myself specialize in carbon dioxide removal. All right, so back to the bathtub. The tub is our atmosphere and oceans. And you've got the faucet on full blast filling the tub. And that's our power plants and factories and cars. When you think about how long that faucet has been open, we're now at a point where the tub is overflowing and the water is kind of getting everywhere. And we need to turn off the faucet, the source of the emissions. That's building more renewables, putting more EVs on the road, shutting down coal power plants, and phasing down oil and gas extraction. But we also need to clean up the mess that we created. The bathroom is flooded after all. One of the things that carbon mitigation strategies focus on, like carbon capture, would be turning off the faucet. But carbon dioxide removal is particularly unique because it's able to really tackle the emissions that are already in our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide removal. This includes an emerging class of engineered technologies that directly capture CO2 from the air and store it or turn it into usable products. It's both the drain and the superabsorbent towel in this overflowing bathtub analogy. And I love this example. It clearly and simply shows why we need to tackle emissions from both sides, the faucet and the drain. But not everyone is moved by a good analogy, including the members of the Article 6 supervisory body of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, who recently said they are not convinced CO2 removal is a real solution. So UNFCCC sets an overall framework for intergovernmental efforts to tackle challenges that we have with emissions. The Article 6 supervisory body issued a guidance in May of this year, which, by the way, is not formally approved yet, and included a technical note that states that engineered carbon removal activities do not contribute to sustainable development. The proposal also calls carbon removal solutions unproven, especially at scale. This draft language is a big deal for a couple of reasons. First, it conflicts with what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says about the need for carbon removal. The IPCC is the UN body of international scientists that informs how the UNFCCC considers the policy framework for cutting emissions. And secondly, it could have huge ramifications for how language gets adopted in upcoming international climate negotiations. The UNFCCC was essentially arguing that carbon dioxide removal solutions 
might take away resources from current and existing mitigation solutions that are being deployed. There's fear of moral hazard. Potentially, yes. But I think that the UNFCCC should be uh, aligning closely to the IPCC report's definition of carbon dioxide removal in that it is a solution that's part of the puzzle to reaching our net zero goals. How high are the stakes in getting it right? I would say the stakes are high, but the UNFCCC is not the only entity that people are persuaded by. The U.S. federal government is a powerful voice, and they have been able to demonstrate that through their commitment to carbon dioxide removal policies and carbon dioxide removal strategies to sort of catalyze not only the research and development pieces, but the actual deployments and the steel in the ground. The carbon dioxide removal industry is growing. It includes a wide array of techniques and technologies that are getting serious attention from governments and investors, and also some debate. This is a proven technology, and we have the ability to develop this technology now. I think the question that we really should be focused on is scale. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. A U.N. panel's dismissal of carbon dioxide removal has raised concerns within the industry. Savvy Bowman of ClearPath joins us to explain why it's far from the last word on the matter and why America is stepping up in a very big way. The Carbon Copy is supported by Fish Tank PR. In this turbulent and exciting energy transition, your approach to communicating with journalists, investors, and customers must evolve. Whether you need to position yourself as a thought leader in between project announcements or translate complex ideas and technologies into tangible, compelling content, Fish Tank can help. To learn more about Fish Tank's approach, visit Fish Tank PR. That's F-I-S-C-H Tank PR. And if you're looking for your next role in PR or media relations, check out Fish Tank's open job listings. The Carbon Copy is brought to you by Savant. No home can be truly smart without smart power. Savant Power Systems let you monitor, store, and control your home's energy, putting the power to live comfortably and sustainably in your hands. The award-winning Savant app tracks real-time energy production to enable maximum efficiency during blackouts and peak energy pricing periods. The Savant Power System. Focus your energy. Learn more at savant.com, S-A-V-A-N-T, savant.com. Carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, is a very broad term. It includes a spectrum of nature-based and engineered approaches, from sequestering carbon in soils, to burning biomass and capturing emissions, to capturing CO2 from fossil power plants and mineralizing it underground. One of the most popular and promising solutions is direct air capture, or DAC. It's still expensive, but many believe it's possible, difficult but possible, to slash costs up to tenfold in the next decade, making it a commercially attractive option. It's essentially a giant filter that sucks out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and uses that CO2 to either store it uh, geologically in saline formations, or you can use it to create fuels, create plastics, um, and a wide array of things. We now even have newer and emerging strategies that involve the ocean, which is really exciting. On the more engineered side, you have a process sometimes referred to as direct ocean capture, where you essentially extract the CO2 from ocean water through electrochemical processes and then store that CO2 or use it. Think of it like the DAC equivalent of the ocean. And so how big is the market? When you look at the market of CDR and what we need to actually accomplish, like how much carbon dioxide do we really actually need to pull out of the atmosphere, this is just a drop in the bucket. The National Academies of Science estimates that we will need to remove 10 gigatons. uh, That's 10 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide yearly by 2050, and then doubling that by 2100. DAC is actually currently hovering around 7,000 metric tons annually globally. So I know this can seem daunting and almost insurmountable, but I think what's really important is that the Department of Energy 
recently issued a report, the Carbon Management Liftoff Report uh, by the Loan Programs Office. And that report actually covers uh, committed announced capacity for all different types of carbon removal solutions, um, including DAC, biomass carbon removal uh, solutions, and then mineralization strategies as well. So there is a broad range, and it is likely that we'll be able to see that um, first million metric ton all the way to the first billion metric ton pretty soon. Yeah, those numbers are incredible, and we need to see the industry scale by many orders of magnitude. Why are we focused so heavily on engineered carbon removal right now, even at this very early commercial scale? I mean, there's there's a lot of fear about the durability of natural of nature-based solutions. Why are people pouring money into this space? And what is the, like, where where is the technology readiness? The reason why the industry has taken so much uh, focus on engineered solutions is because Engineered solutions are able to remove carbon dioxide at the speed and scale that's required to reach our net zero targets. Natural carbon removal solutions are a very important piece of the puzzle, and we need those to continue working. But if we're talking about the square footage it requires to you know, plant trees and have that carbon dioxide removed over time versus the square footage it requires, or a DAC unit might require to remove carbon dioxide in a given time. The DAC unit is going to require less square footage, less energy, and is going to be able to remove more CO2 quickly. And that's what we're really focused on, the more CO2 and quickly part. If we look at the types of technologies for direct air capture and how ready they are for deployment today, there are a couple different sort of mediums. So before I kind of cover what's getting popular today, I'll I'll talk about how direct air capture kind of works. So the DAC process takes in air um, passively, which reacts to a contactor. A contactor is just a big word for a material or a medium that carbon dioxide sticks to. The carbon dioxide is then stripped away from the medium, typically through a process called regeneration, where heat is used and quite a bit of energy to then strip out the CO2 to then uh, store it or use the CO2. Today, the types of mediums, quote unquote, that are popular are solid sorbents and liquid solvent technologies. Um, Those are the most that I've seen sort of that demonstration level activity. Um, And then while, you know, liquid solvents are expected to come uh, closer to that low cost um, faster compared to solid solvents, it's still uncertain which technology will be low cost as more projects develop. I think it's too early to say which one will be the competitive solution because we're still looking at the scale up and the logistics with scale up and how that's going to affect cost. Um, And then if we're looking at sort of the materials and capture processes that are emerging. We also have electric and moisture swing solid sorbents and membrane processes that are emerging. And then also sometimes potentially overlapping with enhanced mineralization processes like you'll see in heirlooms carbon process. So this brings us back to this language in May that worried the industry coming out of the UNFCCC. I know this is draft language, it will evolve over time, but there was worry that it could have an enormous impact on the carbon removal market if the language wasn't changed considerably. How is that language reflective of the different views on the need for engineered carbon removal? When looking at the ecosystem of any new solution, I think there's always going to be, you know, the innovators and the pioneers that are full steam ahead, rolling forward, trying to prove out a solution and want to make sure that they can be effective. And there's always going to also be some level, and this is always healthy, some level of concern just mainly that it will evolve efficiently, will not actually result in any negative um, impacts on a community and also, you know, be able to address the net zero goal in a impactful way. So I think with the UNFCCC guidance 
what's really important to focus on is that they should be incorporating IPCC's definition of carbon dioxide removal. So just to tell you what that is, that is technologies, practices, and approaches that remove and durably store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And that CDR itself is required to achieve global and national targets of net zero CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. And I think also kind of piecing together that these communities that might have concerns um, are also just looking for solutions that align with their uh, thinking, right? There's In CDR, I think it's unique because there's a solution for everybody. There are natural-based solutions, there are hybrid-based solutions, and engineer-based solutions. So in a area where there might be a little bit more apprehension to deploy something like an engineered solution, there's always another alternative that can be brought into the mix. There's enhanced mineralization that can be used. There could be bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So in that way, I feel like there's actually a unique opportunity for everybody because there's a different type of CDR for everybody. The Carbon Copy is supported by Fish Tank PR, a media relations and corporate comms agency dedicated to elevating the work of both early stage and established companies across clean tech, including EV infrastructure, solar plus storage, grid edge tech, software, renewable energy project development, financing, and more. When you're looking for a PR firm, not many of them discuss transparently what drives results. Fish Tank has been in the clean tech industry for more than a decade and is able to use deep expertise to simplify messaging, collaborate effectively with clients, and consistently engage journalists. To learn more about Fish Tank's approach to clean tech and the services they offer, visit Fish Tank PR. That's F I S C H Tank PR. And if you're looking for your next role, check out Fish Tank's job openings. The Carbon Copy is brought to you by Savant. With the launch of its intelligent power system, Savant is redefining what it means to own a truly smart home. The new Savant power system features the ability to monitor, store, and control electricity from the grid and solar to optimize everyday energy efficiency, offset peak utility costs, or maximize stored power to keep your family comfortable and safe during grid outages. The award-winning Savant app displays your energy production and consumption in real time and allows for easy-to-use control and hands-free automation. Plus, the system's scalable design means you can start small and expand as your needs change. When you're in control of your home's energy, the power to save on energy costs while protecting the environment, it's in your hands. The Savant Power System. Focus your energy. Learn more at savant.com. S-A-V-A-N-T, savant.com. Whatever happens with the negotiations around UN language, and it surely will change, countries are stepping up. And America has jumped into CDR in a major way. The Inflation Reduction Act expanded tax credits for the technology. And this month, the Biden administration unveiled $1.2 billion in funding for hubs to support direct air capture projects, plus $13 million for 23 different R&D projects in carbon management. Direct air capture hubs was actually authorized and appropriated in the bipartisan infrastructure law um, in 2021. So this particular program authorized four regional hubs, which each would capture a million metric tons of CO2. Now, this announcement that came out um, covers two of those hubs. The first one being in South Texas, that's the South Texas DAC hub, being uh, led by 1.5, a subsidiary of Occidental Petroleum. And the tech provider for this particular project is Carbon Engineering. They will be removing a million metric tons of carbon dioxide annually um, and storing it uh, geologically. The second project that was announced is Project Cyprus. Now, that's going to be in Louisiana and led by Battelle. The tech providers for this project are going to be Climeworks and Heirloom. Climeworks is actually um, a Swiss company, and they've got a DAC project operating in Iceland. Um, but we'll be working in, with Heirloom this time to deploy a project in Louisiana, and they will also be capturing a million metric tons of CO2. Their storage method is also going to be in saline aquifers, which is just uh, geologic storage. And both of these projects um, will have benefits of, you know, job creation, roughly about, you know, 
2,300 jobs or 2,500 jobs roughly in construction, operations, maintenance, and et cetera. Now, these two hubs are the first part. There were also 19 early stage awards, and those will be critical as well in kind of getting more lessons learned on how carbon dioxide removals or director capture works in all these different types of uh, geographical regions. If you actually look at the map of where everything has been awarded, it's really great to see how diverse the awards have been geographically. So you'll be able to get a lot of good data for the different types of climates, the different types of elevations, topographies, access to um, geologic storage, etc. And then another big piece of news came out of the Energy Earth shots at the Department of Energy. So uh, I remember in the mid-2000s when the Department of Energy created the SunShot initiative, and that was to get the cost of installed utility-scale solar below a dollar a watt. And because of some of those efforts and because of what was happening out in the market, uh, the industry achieved those goals ahead of schedule. One important program is the carbon negative shot. Uh, That was announced last year, and they've started to build on that program. What is that program? What cost targets are they trying to achieve, and why is it critical for the industry? The Carbon Negative Shot program is actually a really important DOE initiative because it looks to um, deploy a suite of carbon removal solutions to reach $100 per metric ton of carbon removed. So that's an all-inclusive cost. And so this program is one of the first indications that the Department of Energy was really taking carbon removal seriously. And actually last Thursday, uh, the night before the DAC Hub's announcement, we saw a notice of intent get released by the Department of Energy for carbon dioxide removals as a whole. So the commercial DAC prize, which is something that was authorizing the Energy Act and then appropriated in the bipartisan infrastructure law, had a director capture pilot prize. And the notice of intent last Thursday covers that 60 million of the funds will actually go towards director capture. But I think what's even more exciting is the track to CDR purchase pilot, because this is allocating 35 million roughly um, over several types of carbon dioxide removal solutions. And this will be the world's first direct government CDR purchasing effort. This is a big deal. There is going to be an opportunity here for a diverse set of solutions to receive funding and catalyze on the same level as director capture. And something I think is not talked about enough is legislation that covers tech inclusivity. And you'll see this in the Carbon Removal and Emission Storage Technologies Act, which was reintroduced in this Congress by Senator Collins and Cantwell, um, and I believe also Cassidy King and Coons, that in the first title actually covers this diversity. It expands the DOE program uh, for CDR even further by adding biomass carbon removal and uh, storage pathways. It includes uh, a little bit more direction for ocean carbon removal. And then most importantly, in the second title, there's a provision for a competitive carbon removal purchase program. So I think talking about the longer term policy opportunities that exist is also super critical in addition to these wins that we've started seeing from the Department of Energy. So what does all this amount to? The purchasing, the funding for demonstration and R&D, the tax credit. This is a pretty impressive collection of policies. Where does this put the industry through the end of the decade? Has America become the front runner in carbon removal? I think so. I'd like to think that by the end of the decade, we're going to see even more wins because of these catalytic mechanisms that have paved the way for American innovation to really take the forefront. We are on track to reach that first billion metric tons. We've paved the way for a lot of different companies to actually come to America. And you'll see this through a lot of the different announcements that are coming out every day with carbon removal companies taking, taking root, actually, in states in America. We have Climeworks with 
uh, who came over from Iceland and plenty of other sort of solution providers that are interested in moving over. So I personally think that America is leading the way in this technology. Savvy Bowman, Program Manager at ClearPath. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephen. The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. You can find all Canary Media's coverage on this at canarymedia.com and sign up for our newsletter to get updates on all of our pods and our coverage and some really cool announcements coming up at postscriptmedia.com. Don't forget to go to the show notes and get your ticket for Transition AI New York. We'll see you there. Uh, this episode was produced by me with help from Dalvin Abouage. Sean Marquand is our engineer. He composed our theme song. Original music came from Echo Finch and Blue Dot Sessions. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures. Thanks to Prelude, they are a VC firm that partners with entrepreneurs across a range of sectors. Uh, They make investments in energy, food and ag, transportation, logistics, advanced materials, manufacturing, and advanced computing. And if you like the show, Apple or Spotify are the place to go to give us a rating and review. And of course, you can hit us up on social media if you uh, have comments on what we're covering. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. We'll catch you next time.